Today's video is about John Locke and his views and impact on education. John Locke was born near Bristol in England. His father was a lawyer and local government officer. When he was younger, Locke studied medicine, uh, natural philosophy, which we now know as science, and philosophy at Oxford. On graduation, he held academic posts at different times in Greek rhetoric and moral philosophy. He became the personal physician of Lord Shaftesbury in 1667, and he combined this with the role of tutor to his son, who was born in 1671. Shaftesbury removed himself to the Netherlands when he was accused of treason in 1687, and Locke accompanied the household into exile. After the accession to the throne of William of Orange, Locke returned to England and he held posts sufficiently well paid and so little onerous that he was able to publish the bulk of his work from 1689 onwards. Locke's An Essay Concerning Human Understanding has come to be viewed as a classic Enlightenment text. In this essay, Locke rejects the notion that human knowledge and moral capacity are innate. He argues instead that the individual should be regarded as a tabula rasa or a blank sheet, literally an unmarked wax tablet on which subsequent experience is imprinted. He is generally regarded as an empiricist philosopher, one who is disposed to be impressed by the extent to which our understanding is delivered to us through our own senses and experience of the world. Locke strongly tended to think of children as white paper or wax to be moulded and fashioned as one pleases. Yet he also suggests a degree of caution. He, he notes that nine parts of ten are formed by upbringing or education and uh, you must give due weight to the last tenth. In Some Thoughts Concerning Education, which is his longest and best known work on the subject, published in 1693, Locke thinks of each child as having an original temper or character. He says, God has stamped certain characteristics upon men's minds, which, like their shapes, may perhaps be a little mended, but can hardly be totally altered and transfor transformed into the contrary. It follows that the educator should carefully observe the character of the individual child to see where improvements can be made and where such efforts would be pointless. or as Locke conceives, where situations where the child merely feigns understanding in order to please adults. Locke rejects training uh, children through what we now call extrinsic motivation, that is by appealing to their desires and aversions. Our knowledge may to a significant degree come via the senses, but to govern actions and to direct conduct by such motives as sensual pleasure and pain is as Locke says, to cherish that principle in him which it is our business to root out and destroy. Locke believes that corporal punishment should be avoided as far as possible. He believes that uh, physical punishment has a propensity to make a, ch a child cowed and low-spirited. This uh, perhaps proceeds from Locke's natural humanity and his revulsion from what was the common practice of his day. Locke believes that children are to be educated and not merely conditioned, and this means that their faculty of reason is to be strengthened and their capacity to resist their desires steadily increased. Locke believed that children are not born with the idea of God or of moral truths, and they do not possess innate moral goodness waiting to be liberated and activated. Locke believes that education turns the self-centered and often demanding infant into the rounded young man. He doesn't have a romantic view of childhood. Locke writes that children are like travelers newly arrived in a strange country and have to learn its customs and ways. They are to learn these, like all else, not by being taught rules, but through practice. If the occasion for practice does not occur naturally, then it must be manufactured. Locke wrote, practice will beget habits in them which, being once established, operate of themselves easily and naturally. The skill of the tutor then is uh, finding such occasions and combining this process of habituation with the active development of the child's power of reason. 
Locke believed that the child should be brought to want to learn. There is no question of simply waiting for this to happen. It is to be engineered. For example, with teaching reading, Locke describes how he set up a conversation for a child to overhear along the lines of how a boy, if taught to read, um, will grow up to be a gentleman beloved by everybody and the apparent effect of this was the child became passionate about learning to read. He also believed that uh, regarding the acquisition of lit literacy this should be turned into a kind of sport through the use of dice, playthings with the letters on them to teach children the alphabet by playing. We can compare Locke's views on education to Rousseau's. So Locke he did not trust children to want to learn naturally which angered Rousseau. Rousseau wrote, Locke would have them taught to read by means of dice. What a fine idea, and the pity of it. There is a better way than any of those, and one which is generally overlooked. It consists in the desire to learn. So here we can see a conflict between Rousseau's child-centered permissive educational philosophy versus Locke's liberal and humane philosophy, but doubts that children will want to learn unless they are properly taught. Locke is not inhumane. He does understand that childhood has its own needs and its own developmental psychology in terms we might use today. He understands that children need play and toys. However, he doesn't consider this child-centeredness. Locke does not place a great degree of emphasis on the happy and fulfilled child and focuses more on the civilized and accomplished adult the child will become. So what will this adult be like which the child will become? Locke states that this adult will possess good habits, moral and otherwise. They will love and value knowledge. They will be a true lifelong learner. They will understand how and where to find knowledge when they want to. They also won't despise manual trades such as carpentry and gardening as such activities can be recreational and fulfilling. So what then is Locke's influence on education? Well, he emphasized the teacher's role uh, in constructing opportunities for the pupil to learn. Even if these situations, opportunities are seemingly manipulative, these can be important in the modern commercial world today and they seem more plausible than the natural education of Rousseau's Emile, where Rousseau talks about the innate and healthy curiosity to learn.